Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat and welcome to our virtual panel discussion on Filipino migration to the United States and the impact of the integration of Filipino immigrants into American society. As we begin, allow me to first express our sincere thanks to the Philam businesses, media organizations, and community members represented here today. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pagsali sa webinar na ito. For the information of everyone, the month of May is National Heritage Month. Since 2004, National Heritage Month has been celebrated annually in May by virtue of Presidential Proclamation Number 439. The celebration aims to create among the Filipino people a consciousness, respect, and love for the legacies of the nation's cultural history. Building on this year's theme, Victory and Humanity, Upholding Filipino Heritage and Identity, the Consulate General, through its Centro Rizal, has presented a weekly virtual commemoration activity throughout May 2021. And in partnership with various Filipino American cultural and community organizations in Los Angeles, which commenced with a flag raising ceremony at the Consulate General on May 10, 2021. This evening's event in particular was conceptualized by the Consulate General to conclude the weekly virtual commemoration program for the National Heritage Month. At this point, May I call on Deputy Consul General Ambrosio Bryan F. and Ciso III to formally introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Vice Consul McChris. Good evening, mga kababayan. I have the honor to make a quick introduction of our new Consul General under whose leadership <laughs> we are conducting uh, these commemoration events. Conjun assumed his post in Los Angeles on the 6th of April, 2021. Immediately before coming here, he served as Consul General of the Philippines in Jeddah in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from February 2018. The Consul General completed his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of the Philippines Baguio before continuing on to finishing law at the UP College of Law. He joined the Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA in 1997. His other previous foreign assignments in the Philippine Foreign Service include Toronto in Canada, New York, USA, and Bangkok, Thailand. During his term as Kanjan in Jeddah, the Consulate General there was awarded by the DFA as Best Organization in the Foreign Service Post category in 2019, as well as garnering a Best Ranking in the Foreign Service category in 2020. Mga binibini ginang at ginoo, Ikinararangal ko pong ipakilala sa inyo upang magbigay ng kanyang mensahe si Consul General Edgar B. Badajos. Maraming salamat, uh, Deputy Consul General Ambrosio Enciso or Ambo. Uh, maraming salamat din kay uh, Vice Consul Macris Corrado. And to our distinguished panelists and guests tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Mga kababayan, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone to this virtual panel discussion on the topic uh, Filipino migration to the United States and the impact of the integration of Filipino immigrants into American society. As mentioned by uh, Vice Consul Macris Corrado earlier, this panel discussion is the culminating activity for our month-long celebration of uh, National Heritage Month in May. Starting in May, starting uh, since the start of May, we have actually uh, presenting weekly commemorative activities in collaboration with various Filipino American social and cultural organizations in Los Angeles. And uh, therefore, before I proceed any further, I'd like to thank these organizations that have uh, partnered with us, uh, including the uh, Filipino American Service Group Incorporated or PASG, the Malaya Filipino American Dance Arts, the Pamana Skill, Pamana Kali, the UCLA Filipinos for Community Health, and Philippines Expression Bookshop. Uh, because of your assistance, uh, we were able to present really a very exciting uh, celebration of uh, Filipino Heritage Month all throughout the month of May. 
Uh, we consulted, we conceptualized this uh, panel discussion tonight with the aim of telling a story, a story of migration, a migration story that is uh, filled with excitement and suspense, as exciting as the next, probably the next uh, Hollywood blockbuster movie. And uh, to help this story, tell, tell, tell us this story, we have invited uh, respected members of the academy who have made significant contributions to the study of the topic, as well as other field arms who have successfully established themselves in leadership roles through entrepreneurship. From the traders and sailors on board the galleon ship Nueva Senora de Esperanza, to the laborers and farm workers of the Manong generation, to the war veterans and their families who have immigrated to the United States, and finally, to the professionals who have contributed much to the of their expertise to the country's economy, the story of the Filipino-American is one of determination, hard work, and yes, assimilation. Assimilation is indeed a trait that every that is innate to every Filipino. We can adapt fast and blend with any culture in the world and make it our own. To many of the Filipinos who have come here, America is not an alien soil but a country that they have come to love and embrace as their own. This is the place where they see their dreams come true, their families reunited and their lives enriched. But going beyond just telling the story of the Filipino America, the other goal of this webinar is also to address how the heritage, traditions and values brought forth from the motherland have molded much of the members of the Filipino diaspora today. In closing, I'd like to encourage everyone to lend their ears to our distinguished expert panelists and to participate in the discussion by sharing your insights or asking questions. I wish everyone an educational, informative, and inspiring evening. Maraming salamat po sa inyong pakikisa sa aming adhihak adhikain nalinangin at pagyamanin ang ating pambansang pamana. Happy National Heritage Month and mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat po, Conjun Ed, for that very inspiring message. Now, before we introduce our resource speakers, please listen to a few reminders for everyone. Right now, Everyone is muted to avoid background noise that may distract you from listening to the key messages and presentations. To interact, you may use the chat portion of the Zoom panel, which is probably on the left or the right side of your screen. Um, and our guest moderator will read them out during the open forum, and we will have the concerned resource speaker respond to your queries or insights later during the open forum. Also, please be informed that this online activity is being recorded. And now, without further ado, allow us to introduce to you our first speaker, who is a scholar and writer who focuses on race, immigration, and LGBTQ issues. He is, a, he is the Assistant Professor of Sociology at Cal Poly Pomona and a Ford Foundation Fellow. He is the author of The Latinos of Asia, How Filipino Americans Break the Rules of Race, recently featured on NPR Morning Edition. He is also a graduate of Stanford University, bachelor's in 2003 and his master's in 2004, and as well as UCLA. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Anthony Christian Ocampo. Hi, um, I just wanna double check. I know that we might be short on time. We still have about 15 minutes. Okay, yes, there we have. great. So I'm just gonna set my timer so I don't go over time. Uh, welcome everyone. I just want to say what an honor it is to be speaking here for the Philippine Consulate. I wish that it could be in person so that we could have um, opportunities to just have small talk and get to know each other on a deeper level and hopefully there'll be an event like that in the future. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to the Philippine Consulate, the office for inviting me. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor uh, as a son of immigrants, son of Filipino immigrants. To be here in this room is just um it's 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 tremendous and i'm really really um 
feeling a privilege that you've granted me the responsibility to share some some little tidbits of Filipino American history that that folks may not necessarily have access to in their everyday lives. Uh, I also want to do a quick shout out and say thank you to my wonderful parents and relatives who decided to jump on the Zoom, as well as their friends. You all know Filipino parents when their kids do something, they want to share it with the world. And so they shared that Zoom very widely. So hi, mom, dad, cousins, ate, kuya, tito, etc. Uh, from West Coast to East Coast, thank you for coming. So um, I'm doing this talk at a very weird time in American history. Uh, we are living in a moment where 4% of nurses in the United States are Filipino, Filipino American, and yet one in three nurses that have passed away from COVID are Filipino. Very, very high uh, disproportionate uh, rates of death among Filipino nurses. We're also living in a time when our, our Filipino elders, as well as other Asian American elders, are, are afraid to walk the streets because they're elder, elderly women that are being attacked randomly uh, by people who, you know, for whatever reason, I can't even, my, my brain can't even fathom why. Um, and we're also coming off uh, several years of, of a previous administration that has spoken, that has not been shy about sharing anti-Asian rhetoric, um, saying things like the China flu, China virus. Um, and so it's just, you know, as much as today's a celebration, I think that it's important as, as people of color, as, as, as brown folks in the United States to acknowledge that as much as we can celebrate all the amazing resilience and, 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 and positive aspects of our community, we can't necessarily just talk about those divorce from all of the, the ugly history that is also part of our being in this country today. And so I think a big part of the reason that Asian Americans are, are being targeted, and I heard this from a, a fellow Asian American author um, recently, is that folks know very, very little. Folks know practically nothing about Asian Americans. And then when you ask them about Filipino Americans specifically, even less so. So when you think about the typical person that come that grows up in the United States, when they turn on the news, when they when they when they go to school, when they're studying for their classes, with the exception of say like a Filipino American student organization or Filipino American organizations like this, there's practically no access for people to learn about Filipino communities. And part of the reason that it's so easy for people to attack folks that look like us is because of ignorance. The inability for folks to see us as full people, as people that are fully human, that have families and histories and communities that we care about. And so I am so, I'm so happy that we have this space to be able to fill in the blanks um, because our society isn't doing a very good job of educating its, its countrymen about Filipino Americans and other Asian Americans. And so just, I know that some of my other co-speakers uh, might be talking about some um, important moments of history, but I wanted to just share a couple of important dates when it comes to Filipino immigration. So even though Filipinos stepped foot in the United States as early as the 1600s, the biggest, the larger waves, the tens of thousands of Filipino Americans that arrived in the United States came not as nurses, but actually came as farm workers, as laborers, uh, predominantly men, the ratio of Filipino laborers that came in the 1920s to 1930s were mostly me men, young men that were working. And they, if they weren't working in the fields, they were working in the fish canneries, they were working as elevator boys, they were working as, as waiters. They were doing essentially the, the physical labor that most native born Americans did not want to do. And they were doing it for very cheap. They were doing it in the poorest of labor conditions. And it's important for me to, to, to point out that as much as the United States and the Philippines have had a very long history with each other, stemming from 1899 during the Philippine-American War, I think sometimes it's, it's, it, gets, it gets really tempting because of all the amazing opportunities that immigrants and their children have had in this country to paint a, a rosy picture of the United States. But it's important to note that historically, Filipinos have often been subjugated by the United States, by, by American society and exploited in terms of labor, exploited in terms of resources, exploited in terms of just like people power to help them advance certain American causes. And those needs, the need for Filipinos 
also stems from the fact that the United States Congress passed laws that essentially banned other Asian immigrants from coming to the United States. So before Filipino Americans were coming in the 1920s and 30s, there was Chinese workers working the farms, the railroads, Japanese workers working in the fields. And because of anti-Asian sentiments, the anti-Asian sentiment in this country was so strong that the United States passed laws that said no Chinese and no Japanese are allowed to come. There has been a history of this country actually killing Chinese people uh, in mass that is erased from our history books. And Filipinos are a part of that because the United States said, hey, we're short on labor. We need to do something about this. And so what they did is they created these interesting loopholes by way of the Philippine American War for Filipino Americans to migrate to this country in a way that was much more free than other Asians. And then they were put in these low paying, low wage work, uh, the Manongs as, as Consul General noted, that were working in the 1920s, 1930s, weren't allowed to marry, weren't allowed to have families. And so this is an important part of Philippine history that we have to think of as connected to the anti-Asian violence that's happening today. The presence of Filipinos in this country became so difficult for white Americans to deal with that in 1936, Congress, within partnership with agricultural labor unions that were upset that Filipinos were taking their jobs, very familiar rhetoric. In 1936, Congress passed what was called the Tidings McDuffie Act, which meant that it would essentially stop Filipinos from coming to the United States at, at 1946 when they would grant the Filipinos independence. Interestingly enough, even though the United States essentially closed its borders to immigrants, again, I want you to think about the language that was being used in the middle of the 20th century. The United States closed the borders to immigration. And that sounds very familiar to some of the language that we've heard um, in the news from more right-wing oriented um, places. And yet the United States, because of the way the, the U.S. Has, has so much power over immigration policy, again created loopholes for Filipinos to work and advance the interests of the United States. During World War II, we all know that World War II took place in Europe, but it also took place in the Pacific. Japan invaded the Philippines. The United States actually recruited a quarter of a million Filipino soldiers to fight on behalf of the United States. And then after the war, these soldiers that fought risked their lives for the United States. Some died. They were not granted benefits by the United States. And so this is an interesting paradox because as much as the United States presents itself as this country of land, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, in theory, that was working, but only for certain subsets of people, usually folks of European descent, while Black, Brown, Latinx, Indigenous, uh, Filipino Americans included, were not part of that equation of who is access to the American dream. And so a lot of the stuff, a lot of the perception that we have of Filipino Americans being successful in this country, right? When we think about Filipinos today in 2020, we think about the nurses, we think about the engineers, we think about the, 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 the other college educated professionals. The reason that Filipinos for the most part that are coming today fit from those more educated, are from those more educated classes is because in 1965, the United States Congress reopened the borders to immigration, but said only certain types of immigrants, quote unquote, desirable immigrants are allowed to come from the Philippines. And so what happens in the U.S.? You have a major health, uh, health worker shortage because of um, health worker shortage because of World War II. And you have this incredibly large surplus of English speaking uh, workers that have health facilities to be trained in, that were going to nursing school. And so again, the United States after 19, in the 1950s, 60s, opened the door for Filipino nurses and other professionals to come. 
And so it's important to note that part of the reason that we're able to enjoy this narrative of the successful Filipino immigrant is because laws are set up to only let certain classes of Filipino immigrants come to the United States. And so it's interesting because depending on what country you're from, the door will be thrusted open. So for Filipinos, the door is thrusted open because of colonial ties, English speaking population, educated population. But for a lot of other immigrants, it's, they only come because America leaves the back door open. So they're coming um, you know, by foot, they're coming as refugees. And it's important to note that not everyone is at the same starting point. The reason I bring this up is because as much as it's important to know Filipino American migration patterns, Filipino American history, it's so important that we do not divorce our understanding of who Filipinos are from our understanding of who other people of color are in the United States. In the Filipino community, I have heard rumblings about the anti-Asian attacks and people are, 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 are noting that, oh, it's a certain group that's attacking Filipinos, right? And part of the reason we have that perception is because what's portrayed in the media. But when you look at the actual numbers, when you look at the actual statistics that show what is the source of anti-Filipino violence in this country, for the most part, anti-Filipino violence has been an outgrowth of white supremacy in the United States. And it's important to name that. I know it's not a comfortable conversation. I know we often try to, you know, we're a resilient people that likes to think of the most, like, try, we can power through anything. But for the sake of our children of immigrants, for the sake of U.S. born Filipinos, it's important for us to know this, both the great things about our history, the way that we fought for civil rights, the way that we organized for community rights, but also important for us to know these not so, not so glamorous sides of our history, because that gives us an opportunity to form connections with other people of color in the United States that are going through similar struggles, whether it has to do with immigration, whether it has to do with health inequality, whether it has to do with racism, whether it has to do with sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. When Filipino Americans are able to harness all aspects of their history, it becomes an important point of unity for them to build bonds with Mexican Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, African Americans, Muslim Americans. And it's only through that unity that we'll able to really, really attack some of the systemic racial inequalities that are happening across our society. The, the reason we have hashtags, the reason we're seeing violence is because there is system-wide racist, uh, racist things happening in every institution that exists. And so I, I really hate to start with a downer, but I feel like it's so, so necessary. We come from a, we, our people come from a country where inequality is rampant. And if we're, if we're afraid to tackle the inequality here, it, it doesn't necessarily send the right message to our children and get grandchildren who will have no framework to understand the, the things that they go through when they start entering schools, trying to get jobs, trying to move up in society. And so um, I just want to thank you for this space. Um, and I'm very, very thrilled to be in conversation with everybody and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ocampo, for that very um, insightful talk. Now we turn to our second speaker, who is a professor at the Department of Asian Languages and Culture of the University of California in Los Angeles. She is an actor, filmmaker, artist, and writer who has authored several publications on the study of Filipino language and literature. She holds a PhD degree in Philippine studies from the University of the Philippines and studied at the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute, Los Angeles, California. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Nenita Pambid Domingo. Um, magandang 
Uh, gabi po sa inyong lahat, uh, hinahanap ko lang po yung aking PowerPoint. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat uh, sa pag-imbita sa akin. Um, nasabi na po ni uh, Anthony ang karamihan sa mga nandi dito, pero bago ako magsimula, um, nais kong um, magpasalamat at uh, kilalanin ang um, ang Kish Nation. Now, this is to acknowledge and pay respects to those whose ancestral and unceded lands we enjoy as we work, teach, and learn. I pay respect to the ancestors, elders, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Um, may kasabihan tayo na ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan, hindi makararating sa pagtutunguhan. Um, walang duda malaki ang kontribusyon ng mga Pilipino sa bansang Amerika. Uh, mula uh, labing walo, limang putpito hanggang dalawampu, dalawamputisan. Ano nga ba ang uh, narating ng mga Pilipino sa Amerika? Uh, magbalik tanaw muna tayo. Naginawa na ni Anthony, no? So, baka bibilisan ko lang iba mga slides at papakita ko na yung mga larawan para mabigyan ng laman ng mga sinabi ni Uh, Anthony kanina ng mga larawan. Uh, alam na natin ito, karamihan sa atin, ano, merong 180 regional languages sa atin, pero ang official languages natin ay uh, Filipino, English, at saka Spanish until 1973. Tapos uh, alam natin po ilang milyon merong mga Pilipino overseas mga Romano Katoliko tayo dahil sa Espanya, uh, sa kolonisasyon. Sabi nga, uh, more than 350 years in the convent at 50 years in Hollywood or 48 years to be exact. Tapos, uh, nabili ang Pilipinas sa Treaty of Paris dahil natalo ang Pilipinas. At saka, ang Espanya. No? Kaya doon nagsimula ang ating kasaysayan sa pagpunta ng mga Pilipino dito sa Amerika. So, our history is a colonial history of a nation who long to be part of and belong and be acknowledged and whose contribution to American society has helped shape the multicultural fabric or the salad bowl or melting pot that is the United States. So, ito lang po yung mga ilang mga um, Importante yung mga pecha noon, no? in 1857, there's the Pedro de Unamunos California Expedition and the Filipinos were called Luzones Indios who served as slaves in the galleon as rowers. And with uh, Father Junipero Cero at the founding of the mission at Monterey in 1779. And in 1781, Antonio Miranda Rodriguez was identified as Filipino in the documents by the late Bill Mason. Uh, as one of the original founders of Los Angeles and was later the Iron Smith of Santa Barbara, California in 1782. Uh, and in St. Malo, New Orleans, uh, it was published in 1883, the Manila Settlement, wherein there were Filipinos who were speaking Spanish. So, uh, nabanggit na po ito kanina, no? pinapakita ko lang sa inyo. Kaya nabanggit Kanina ni Anthony na mayroong mga hindi magagandang aspeto ang ating kasaysayan dito. Uh, ito si Carlos Bulosan, dito niya inilarawan ang mga paghihirap na pinagdaanan ng ating mga kababayan noong mga 1920s to 30s. Uh, ito ang mga larawan ng Amerika sa Pilipinas, Filipino-American War. Uh, and here are the events that shape the history of Filipinas and other communities of color like the Japanese and the Chinese. So uh, Anthony has mentioned already the World War II because um, for, in order for the Filipinos to serve in the U.S. Army, they have to be U.S. citizens. And communities of color and other marginalized groups fought for civil rights and were involved in national and international movements for liberation. 
And there were also landmark legislation and events, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and Immigration Act of 1965, the Watts Riots in 1965, the 1965 Great Strike started by Filipinos, which lasted for five years. And in November 6, the longest student strike um, at the San Francisco State College, Third World Liberation Front. So uh, the descendants of all these um, laborers wanted an education that was relevant. So in 1960, Tagalog was the first Southeast Asian language taught at UCLA. So here's a brief history of our country. And what is Filipino? Filipino is the national language, and it's also the name for the people. And um, most of you know this already, so I won't go into this anymore. And uh, we had our national language because, uh, as Anthony mentioned, they passed the Tidings McDuffie Act because the American state Filipinos were taking uh, the jobs from the Americans. So let me go fast forward. So today in the US Census Bureau, uh, and this is the latest one that we could access, uh, they refer to Filipino as Tagalog, including Filipino, but the preferred name is Filipino. According to the U.S. Census Bureau 2018, there are 1,760,468 Tagalog speakers, including Filipino, of the 2,920,160 Filipinos in the whole of the United States. Filipino called Tagalog in the U.S. Census is the third most widely spoken foreign language of which 364,685 speakers live in GLA or the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, in both the nation as a whole and greater Los Angeles area, Filipino is the third most widely spoken language other than English, Spanish, and Chinese. So uh, who speaks Filipino? So it is number one in California, number two in Illinois, number three in Texas, number four in Nevada, number five in New Jersey, and number six in New York. And you would notice why there are many Filipinos in these uh, states, it's because of the military, because of the nurses. And within GLA, uh, LA has the highest number of speakers at 233,814, where it is again the third most widely spoken non-English language in San Bernardino County. It is also the third most widely spoken foreign language after Chinese, with 29,355 speakers, while in Orange County, Filipino ranked fifth with 48,144 speakers after Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Korean. Filipino came in second in Riverside County with 40,767 speakers, as well as in Ventura County with 11,805 speakers. So um, all these uh, statistical numbers, you could find this uh, in the U.S. Census Bureau um, website. So I won't go into this anymore. So I'm just showing you the slides. And this is just a summary of where the Filipinos are concentrated and where they are speaking the language. So Filipinos are the second largest Asian population in the whole of the United States, according to the 2018 United States Census. What accounts for this big number of Filipino immigrants in the US? The reason for the great number of Filipinos living in the US is first due to colonization, second is the rampant poverty obtaining in the home country, and the desire for the proverbial American dream to better one's lot. 
So I won't go into this anymore. Everyone knows this. So the first Filipinos came as slaves here in the, U in the US. Uh, during the American colonial regime, Filipinos were considered U.S. nationals and did not need a visa to come to the U.S. The large number of Filipino immigrants was the result of the immigration policy of the U.S. and the U.S. needs for Filipinos trained in the U.S. to run the colonial government. Uh, it was also driven by the expansionist need for cheap agricultural laborers to work the fields of California, Oregon, Washington, sugar plantation in Hawaii, tannery workers and fishermen in Alaska and Seattle in the 20s and the 30s. And uh, after World War II, and uh, as uh, Anthony has mentioned, more uh, Filipinos who are professionals entered the United States. So at present, the top three immigrant population mirrored the number of speakers of languages other than English in the U.S. According to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Mexico has the most number of immigrants in the U.S. followed by the People's Republic of China and the Philippines. The flow of immigrants from these countries are steadily increasing and not declining, as shown by the figures from 2015 to 2019 and from 1980 to 2018. So here are the numbers if you're interested in them. And again, these are public knowledge and then they can be accessed uh, to the website. So for the total low full permanent resident population, um, India overtook the Philippines for that period. The Philippines had a steady number of immigrants at 580,000 individuals. And see, the numbers are increasing, it's not decreasing. Uh, most Filipino immigrants in the US are legally present, but according to Migration Policy Institute, there are approximately 313,000 unauthorized Filipino immigrants in the 2012-2016 period. MPI also estimated that there are approximately 20,000 26,000 Filipino unauthorized immigrants who were eligible for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or the DACA program. But as of March 2020, there were only 3,270 Filipinos among the 643,600 active participants, according to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So, who speaks uh, Filipino in GLA? Um, I will just breeze through this because I know the, the slides I prepared were, uh, it's more, more than the 15 minutes allowed for each one of us. So, uh, of course, Filipinos would say, who else would speak Filipino but those who know how to speak the language? So what now? So Filipino as the national language serves as a signifier of national unity and national identity of the multilingual nation that is the Philippines. At present, Filipino is a less commonly taught language in the US. It is a non-major, non-minor field of study, despite the fact that Filipino is the third most widely spoken language in the US. Due to the fact that Filipino does not figure in the global, geopolitical, cultural, social, and economic scheme of things, Although 43% of Filipino immigrants are more likely to be employed in management, business, science, and arts occupations. This implies that naturally the language that spells success in the mainstream is English and not Filipino. Nevertheless, there is a continuous flow of Filipino immigrants to the US, as I have shown you earlier in the previous slides. So, um, we did the study of uh, uh, Filipinos, to, uh, Filipinos who, who are in the Gen 1, uh, who are adults who came here to the U.S. as adults and were 18 years old and above. 
Gen 1.5 would be teenagers 11 to 17 years old, which are mostly my students at UCLA. And Gen 2 is the 0 to 10. Those born here or who came here when they were one year old, between one year old and 10 years old. So Gen 1 immigrants are the prime movers in establishing Filipino language and cultural schools. They were also the generation that worked for the passage of AB 420 on September 29, 2005, which provided for the creation of a, of a California subject examination for teachers on Filipino. History shows that it was the student move it, movement in the 60s uh, that paved the way for Filipinos and other immigrant languages in the universities and higher education. Stakeholders and community uh, leaders as well as community leaders in the educational institutions would do well to institutionalize and establish Filipino and Philippine studies programs in their curricula. This calls for the intellectualization of Filipino for use in the academe and scholarly discourse. Um, Gen 1 and Gen 1.5 are whole when they immigrated to the US. Most of them have a firm foundation of the language and culture and are aware of the utility of Filipino language in organizing and serving the newly arrived immigrants to help them navigate the system and to enable them to find a place where they feel safe and at home. For the recent immigrants, Filipinos import and especially living in the new environment. It is familiar. For Gen 1.5 immigrants, the pain of dislocation, leaving their friends and relatives are echoed in these comments. It kept me sane when I was away from my family for the first time. With parents who grew up accustomed to Filipino language, the language is dear to me as it's the main language between me and my parents. Also through my native tongue, I can narrow the gap between me and the Filipino community. These are comments from my students. So for the Gen 2, um, they are very eager to learn the language and culture for personal uh, reasons to reclaim their identity. So one interview we wrote, knowing and using Tagalog helped me understand myself in a better sense. I can use words to describe things I cannot describe in English. It is my culture. It is who I am. And another one wrote life. So uh, this is a project that we did in class. And this mask shows the dichotomy of the identity of Filipino American uh, students, uh, specifically in my class. So see, you see uh, Filipino food, respectful, coconut, fob, flat nose. And you can see the violence that my students are feeling as Filipino Americans born and raised here in the US. So one student said the patterns on my mask are intertwined yet battling each other, derived from native pre-colonial tattoos. These represent my struggle to integrate Filipino culture into being in America. I find contradictions in my life, such as my parents not teaching me Tagalog and yet expecting me to show respect by using po. This has caused internal confusion of how I am supposed to fully embrace being American and Filipino at the same time. I really resonate with this mask because their experience is very, very similar to mine growing up. For me, I was born in the US and only ever knew what life was like in the States. Being Filipino was my ethnicity, but I didn't know much more about what that really meant. I felt like I was too American to even be Filipino. I didn't grow up knowing much about the culture and I never learned Tagalog either because I didn't have that understanding of what a Filipino actually is. I constrained myself to think that I wasn't Filipino because I didn't have the set base characteristics. It wasn't until I came to college and joined different Filipino organizations and spaces and realized that being Filipino isn't defined by any one thing. Just because I did grow up in the Philippines or didn't speak the language fluently doesn't make me any less Filipino than anyone else. Regardless of what I do or do not know about the culture is not indicative of how much Filipino-ness I have. Being involved in these Filipino spaces has made me not only embrace my Filipino culture more, but it's made me appreciate how rich our culture is. 
the one thing I love about the Filipino community at UCLA is that they've fostered a sense of family into everything. There was never a feeling of displacement from not speaking the language or only being half or not looking Filipino enough. It gave me the space to define what being a Filipino meant to me. And so this community has allowed me to discover and be proud of my individual Filipino American experience. And this one came from uh, an elder who was uh, part of this study. I say salamat, thank you, to express my gratitude to God for the many blessings I have as a Filipino American elder. I have put the misery of the past and behind me. Feeling grateful has helped me cope with living alone away from my 14 children. I have found peace in prayer and in helping other seniors in need of counsel. I keep the belief in my goodness and the goodness of others. So this um, project can be accessed in uh, Facebook and the address is below. Uh, as one respondent said, a heritage language serves as a bridge and is used in organizing to help newly arrived immigrants to embrace being Philippine American and at the same time retain, retain their Filipino identity with the American self. Teenage years are traumatic and challenging years for Filipino youth as they suffer isolation and discrimination due to being separated from family and everything familiar. Also, there is the language barrier. Although English is one of the official languages of the Philippines and is the medium of instruction in schools, not everyone truly acquired the language and having a fab or fresh off the boat accent adds to the feeling of inferiority. So um, this would be my, my last um, slide that I will be sharing with you. Um, Filipino is an anchor to Filipino identity. Being able to speak a tongue that they are familiar with and that reminds them of home that they have left behind enables an organizer to build trust, confidence and rapport and be welcome to the immigrant community as being one of them. In that way, he is able to help them navigate the system. As an organizer, he is able to help newly arrived immigrants to achieve a better outcome, enable them to find better jobs and help them build their self-confidence, self-worth and self-esteem. Without an anchor and to be simply American is to deny their full humanity. Thank you very much. And um, I hope um, I have contributed uh, to the Filipinoness of all the students and all those who are listening now. Uh, nagsimula ako sa uh, isang kasabihan na kailangan lumingon tayo sa pinanggalingan upang makadating sa paroroonan natin. Maraming contribusyon ng mga Pilipino uh, at hinaradangal natin itong lahat. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Domingo. Now, we are also honored to have with us this evening, Mrs. Linda Nietes Little. Mrs. Nietes has been an ally and partner to the Consulate General in promoting a better understanding of the richness of Filipino culture. Since its establishment in 1984, her Philippine Expressions Bookshop has pioneered in the promotion of Filipino books in the U.S. and has been at the forefront of showcasing Filipino writings, literature, and reference materials. Magandang gabi po, Mrs. Nietes. Dedicated to Filipino Americans in search of their roots. Philippine Expressions Bookshop was established in 1984 to provide a home for Philippine writings in America, as well as books written by Filipino Americans. The bookshop promotes books written in English and other Philippine languages on all aspects of Philippine culture for all ages. 
now on its 36th year in Los Angeles, the bookshop blazed the trail and opened new doors to make Philem writers more visible in the mainstream literary scene. It is the first Filipino-American bookshop on American soil, and it was inspired by a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. It is located in the downtown arts district of San Pedro, California, where the bookshop hosts literary soirees, such as publication and meets the author parties, book talks, lectures on Philippine culture by visiting Filipino scholars, and poetry readings throughout the year. These community outreach programs are offered free to the public. Every year during National Women's History Month in March, they sponsor a Pinay gathering to introduce and highlight the works of Pinay authors in the community. During their year, they also have specific programs to highlight National Poetry Month in April, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in May, with focus on children, and Filipino American History Month in October. In the words of owner and trailblazer, Linda Nietas Little, the bookshop is a marriage between culture and business. All around the bookshop and its affiliate, Pinta Dos Art Gallery, Philippine cultural artifacts are displayed to familiarize Americans of Filipino ancestry with the culture of their ancestors. Yes, they sell culture. They also sell books. Okay, that is a quick introduction of the Philippine Expressions Bookshops Bookshop, and now we have Ms. Little. Uh, please unmute, Mrs. Nietis Little. Uh, give us a second. There's, we just got to unmute our speaker. Mrs. Little, kindly click on the dialog box where it says unmute. Okay, let us just wait. <laughs> uh, let's just wait and let's see. Mrs. Little, can you please unmute yourself? I guess, you know, Zoom is very, um, you know, we, this is the new kind of meetings that we have. So some people don't get it as quick as others, but I'm sure Mrs. Little will get it soon enough. Um, okay, uh, Mrs. Little, um, we, we're going to ask you to go back into our Zoom so we'll, you will come in without muting yourself, okay? Okay, okay. Now, um, can we have our um, technical guys to please bring Mrs. Little back in? I believe she is in the waiting room. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, would you mind just waiting a few minutes? Okay, she's already in. We're just making sure that her audio is there, okay? Okay, she, she's still on mute. She's still on mute, Mrs. Nietes. Um, can you please unmute, Mrs. Nieves? Um, okay, uh, this is quite awkward, but okay, let's go and check on Mrs. Nieves. I can see her right now, but I cannot hear her. Can you hear her, guys?
Okay, Mrs. Sanders, can you please unmute yourself? Just click on the mic on the lower left of your screen. You will get it. See, we can see you. We're all, we're all, we could almost hear you. So close yet so far. Nobody can hear you yet, Mrs. Nettes. Can you please unmute yourself? Uh, okay, Mrs. Little, can you please uh, locate at the lower left of your screen? There is a mic icon there. Can you click on it, please? Don't worry, guys, she'll get it. You guys got it, so you're, she's going to get it, too. Okay, we cannot hear her yet, but I think she can hear us. So, um, okay, can you, uh, Mrs. Nietes, can you, can you uh, tap on the space bar to unmute yourself? And just tap on the space bar right here. Don't worry, they're all gonna wait for you. So just, just tap it here. So you can unmute yourself, okay? So you have your keyboard, just tap on the space bar. There you go. Say hi. Okay, no, can you hear can you hear them, ladies and gentlemen? I, they can't hear you yet. I can't hear you yet. So can you tap it again? Nobody can hear. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand. Just give just give Mrs. Little a few minutes to get her bearings. Okay. So you tap on the space bar or you go on the lower left of your of your screen. There's a mic there. Okay. Um, okay, because of this, um, we will get back to you. Very, very soon, Mrs. Nieles, but um, while you are working on your presentation, we will now be going on to our um, open forum, and then we will get back to you. Now, let us all welcome our guest moderator for this evening, Filipino Young Leaders Program alumna and founder of Entrepreneurship, Ms. Anna Marie Cruz, to formally start and moderate our discussion. Before proceeding further, I also wish to request Ms. Anna Marie to say just a few words about her own advocacies about entrepreneurship and perhaps insights on our topic based on her own experiences as a Filipina American entrepreneur. Magandang gabi, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be among you and to speak on, um, to speak with you about the many different topics that are uh, coming up. Obviously, I uh, have a particular attention to entrepreneurship, and I'd like to share just a little bit about what we're doing at Entrepreneurship, how it came about, and also how it plays a role in uh, in in the. Um, self-determination of our community. So I'll go ahead and just share my screen here. And Mrs. Nietas, just um, uh, uh, another tip. If you have a, um, a separate phone, you can probably call into the audio if, you have, if you're able to get the um, phone number from, from the group. Um, so real quick, um, I just want to share a little bit about entrepreneurship. Um, it's a, a diaspora ecosystem that's devoted to advancing, um, uh, obviously, entrepreneurship, particularly for Filipina women. Um, okay, hold on just a sec. I cannot get out of my screen. Everyone is having technical issues. <laughs> um, oops, okay. Uh, so first, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Anna Marie Cruz. I'm actually an economic development professional, and I manage a national capacity building program for small business entrepreneurs called Inner City Capital Connections. Uh, it's uh, offered by a national nonprofit organization called The Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, founded by Harvard strategy professor Michael Porter. And if you don't know Michael Porter and you're interested in how his theory uh, impacts uh, some of the thinking in the Philippines, this is actually written 
um, I hope you can see this. This is written by uh, Dr. Bernardo Villegas called The Philippine Advantage. Uh, so Dr. Michael Porter's work has been um, uh, used by many different economies, including various countries, as, uh, as, as you see here, uh, economists even in the Philippines, uh, to determine the competitiveness and, and ways that we can uh, be competitive through our different industries, particularly um, in emerging industries today. Uh, so IC has trained over 3,800 businesses across the US who have raised $2.3 billion in uh, capital, uh, increased their revenues by 126%. 46% of the businesses are women owned, 64% are BIPOC owned. Um, and uh, this is you know, such a privilege for me to be able to do this work every day. I'm also the founder of entrepreneurship as I had um, uh, mentioned. So entrepreneurship is a, um, a passion project of mine. It's a social impact project that I um, uh, really um, developed as I was thinking through about the impact of entrepreneurship in our community. Um, and just a little bit about myself. I was born in Bataan. Uh, I came here when I was nine years old. And, and, okay, I think um, for oh, a while it was stuck. There you are. Okay, should I pause? That's okay. Go ahead. After your presentation, we can have Mrs. Little. Don't worry. Okay, great. So um, upon moving here, um, I, you. I also... Um, uh, went through a, a number of um, career changes, but after I um, got my MBA at the University of Michigan, I actually went back to Asia and worked with the, with the International Labor Organization, which is part of the UN, on this project in Vietnam, helping women weavers develop their own sustainable business. From that, I um, uh, joined SIPA, Search and Involve Filipino Americans here in Los Angeles to be a business counselor. Uh, th this is also part of a women's business center called AP small business program. And I, I want to share this because these are resources that are here for our community. Um, these organizations both offer training and mentorship for small business owners that unfortunately many of us uh, don't know or don't take advantage of. Um, from here, I also um, uh, spent some time in mission-based lending, providing capital to small business owners uh, through a CDFI and CDC called um, CDC Small Business Finance. And currently I'm at ICIC. Phil Pro was an integral part of my journey in building entrepreneurship um, and really thought about how our community across the diaspora can both be united, but also uh, leverage the fact that we are such a strong international community um, to, to develop new ways that we can be self-sustaining. Um, so now I'd like to share with you some, um, this is our mission and vision, some things around um, small businesses in the LA area, um, particularly the impact of COVID on small businesses here. Um, so this study was conducted in um, February of 2021 and really looked at the impact in the different industries as well as different communities in the greater LA region. Uh, I can share the study with you in the chat box in a moment. Um, so what this shows you is um, there were industries that were severely hit um, and these were from various surveys, but um, the, the businesses that you can imagine are the ones that are in retail, food and beverage, hospitality, um, many, many AAPI owned businesses in this particular um, uh, category. And then businesses that were impacted but are surviving and then businesses that were um, particularly insulated or even uh, continued to grow. So if we look at the breakdown of ethnicity and given that it is AAPI Heritage Month, I wanna pay particular attention to the Asian owned businesses, that 30%, almost a third of them were in the hardest hit categories. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, well, in terms of what the greatest needs were in the last year, this is actually from before the pandemic, uh, but we saw the same thing during and currently um, during the pandemic, as well as um, now, as we go into reopening, that access to capital remains the greatest need for small businesses and businesses in general. And if we look at, again, that last category, if you look at the breakdown of Asian-owned businesses, uh, there's quite um, uh, a big chunk there that, that needs um, capital. Now, one thing I want to note is um, 
when business owners or small businesses are turned down for traditional financing, such as banking, there are institutions like one I was at, which is a CDFI or Community Development Financial Institution. And these organizations are funded by, uh, certified by the treasury, funded by many different um, institutions, including banks that are required to support community development. But I want to point out that the elegi eligibility requirement for CDFIs, if you look at the definition below, you will notice that there's a category that's missing. And this seems to be the, the trend when it comes to AAPI representation or visibility. So if you think about policy and how that impacts access to capital for businesses, for community organizations, uh, organizations that benefit from CDFIs. Um, most AAPI-led organizations in this category have to justify their existence or their work beyond this eligible market definition. Um, I also want to share that in the pandemic, there were some interesting, um, obviously, impact um, that hit businesses, but there were also a lot of uh, wonderful pivots, um, including our local businesses. Um, you may know uh, of Lhasa Restaurant, which has now pivoted to La Cita, which offers this uh, wonderful chicken and asal and other grilled and um, uh, roasted dishes. You may also know of Petit Peso, which is in downtown LA, another great business that opened during the pandemic. So another need of small businesses is capacity building, training, and education. That is, that is actually one of the things that we aim to do at Entrepreneurship, is to provide both the community of culturally relevant resources as well as training. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we are going to get into some juicy Q&A. Um, actually, we're going to go back to Mrs. Nietes. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you very much, Ms. Anna Marie, for that wonderful presentation about entrepreneurship, which I have heard so much about. And now she'll go back to Mrs. Little. So uh, thank you for being with us, Mrs. Little. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the technical problem. And good evening to everyone. And my thanks to the Philippine Consulate General in Los Angeles for inviting me to speak and be part of the panel tonight. Since we are celebrating National Heritage Month, I would like to speak on a subject very dear to my heart. And I would like to start by saying, I speak as a bookshop owner, I speak as a book lover, a literary activist, a social entrepreneur, and a culture bearer. Women always are thought of as culture bearers, but we are the ones that are kind of relegated to pass on the culture to our children. And Culture is usually imbibed to her home environment through books and, of course, through oral history that are passed on from children to children, of course, from grandparents to parents and to children. At any rate, let me just mention that when I opened my bookshop way back in 1972 in Forbes Park, Metro Manila, during the height of martial law, it was foremost in my mind that as a culture barrier, I should specialize only in books related to Philippine culture. And to this day, I have done that as part of my vision. And when I opened my bookshop in Los Angeles in 1984, I dedicated it to Filipino Americans in search of their roots. And to this day, I meet young Filipino Americans coming to the bookshop, certainly in search of their roots or the roots of their parents and grandchildren and grandparents. By the way, by December 9, uh, 2022, I would have spent 50 years of my life doing this line of work. 
And I can truly say I'm very proud. I've provided a home for Philippine writings in both sides of the Pacific. Since I opened our bookshop in 1984 uh, here in Los Angeles, I would like to speak to the young professionals in the audience. If we really want to contribute our best to America, our newfound home, we should know who we are and where we come from and be proud of our ancient past. Books are the vehicles that we normally use to be able to find our roots. And we invite you to come to the bookshop and search for the background of your parents or grandparents and see the culture that they left behind in the Philippines, which they willingly will share with you if you ask them. In this way, if we we do not suffer any identity crisis being brown in white America. We should know who we are so we can face the future with confidence. Young people should read books of our culture and enjoy reading. You know that saying, readers become leaders. Since we opened our bookshop 37 years ago, thousands of young Filipino Americans have come to the porters and we'd like to feel that we have contributed to the appreciation of our customs and traditions, have shared the wise and the house of our culture and not just our food, music, or dance. And I speak to the parents in the audience. Parents, we know that the future belongs to young people and we should encourage our young children to read books relevant to our people. However, parents should show the example by being readers yourselves because children tend to follow what their parents are doing. Go to the public library and bring your kids Ask for Philippine books. Librarians will be happy to know that more Philams are coming to use their resources. After all, we Filipinos, part of the taxes that we pay, help subsidize public libraries all over the US. So we should take that into account. And do not be afraid to rock the boat if necessary, ask and question why there are not enough Philippine books in the library. Apparently the reason is that if you don't ask for it, they don't really allocate the budget for it. So be active, proactive for that reason. And when your children are assigned homeworks to write on something, encourage them to write about the Philippines. This way, they will be able to dig into the history, the culture of our people. And in the process, I'm sure they will learn to love the culture of their ancestors. And of course, we should remember, our children will grow up to be Americans of Philippine ancestry. And it is good that they do not forget their ancestral roots. By the way, when I first arrived in LA, before I established in 1984, you can practically, practically count the number of Filipino American authors by your 10 hands, uh, 10 fingers, I mean. 
all these years, we have worked hard to make the Filipino-American authors be put in the map, the literary map of Los Angeles and other places around the city. And this way we have contributed to the growth and interest in Philippine writings. Now we have Filipino-American authors galore and we're very happy about that result. We work hard to increase their visibility and at the same time, create more awareness for the Filipino presence in America. And we are happy with our contributions to our Filipino American community. In closing, let me just say, let's all stand tall as Americans of Philippine ancestry. We assimilate in American society, but we should not forget our ancient past and our cultural heritage. Maraming salamat sa inyo lahat. Mabuhay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Little, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Now, I guess, Ms. Anna Marie, you are ready for our question and answer portion. Ms. Anna Marie? Are you trying to unmute? Oh, no. What is that? <laughs> Okay, there ben. we go. I was not allowed to unmute for a moment. Thank okay. you so much. So if you have not yet put up your question, please go into the chat box and do so. Um, you have heard from um, wonderful speakers today talking about different um, uh, angles of the Filipino, Filipino American experience. Um, we do have some questions I'd like to get started with, but before we do that, I just wanna share this, this comment from Evelyn Andamo. It is high time that we ensure others outside of the Philippines are made aware of the existence of our national language referred to as the Filipino language, not Tagalog, which is the only, which is only the basis of our national language. Uh, anyone want to react to that? All right. Well, that's an interesting and um, uh, good point. We have so many dialects across our thousands, seven, 7,600 or 7,100 some uh, islands. So uh, thank you for noting that. So here's a question from MJ Ricadio of the Philam Press Club. Other researchers have um, said that uh, we, the Indio Luzones, were educated and not slaves. Do we have a record that says we were slaves during the Manila Galleon expedition? And I believe that may be directed to Dr. Ocampo. Or any of our panelists. I think we need to unmute all of the speakers at once. Our IT section, please. Oh, there you go. Hi, um, MJ. I'm not a. I'm a sociologist, um, and so when it comes to history, I definitely want to refer to my colleagues who are much more squarely knowledgeable about that particular point in history. Um, and you know, I, I messaged you on the chat, Dr. Rudy Guevara at Arizona State University has done a tremendous amount of research on the Manila Galleon, Manila Acapulco Galleon trades and the cultural exchange that happened there. And, um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't want to mischaracterize um, the status of, of those who, who, who moved across the Pacific during that particular period of time. So I'm gonna to defer to the historians. Um, hi, my name is Nanita Domingo. I, I was, uh, I'm teaching at UCLA. And uh, yung mga sources ko, it came from uh, Eliza Bora and Bill Mason, who was the curator of the Natural History Museum. So, and siya, primary sources siya. So I don't know who else have done such uh, 
work with primary sources regarding the background of Luzon and si Indios. Pero yun na sinasabi ni, ni, ni Bora. I think Anna Marie is 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 needs to be unmuted. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. And thank you, Dr. Domingo, for that additional comment. Um, Mrs. Nietas, might you have something to add to this as well from the different books, the collection that you have there in your library, in your bookstore? I have not really come across any specific reference to their educational or you know, state of life background. So I can't do much comment on that. And part of the challenge, obviously, is the um, uh, lack of written history, perhaps, from that time. Uh, and also the uh, impact of um, some of the languages also being erased. Um, uh, that is not sourced, but uh, that is what um, I know from what I have learned in some of my classes. Um, so next question is from Deputy Consul General Ambo and CISO. What is unique about the Filipino experience that compared to other Asian migrants, there was a generation of Filipinos in America who were not taught to speak Tagalog or other Philippine languages that the first generation migrants brought with them? Could you repeat that, please? Sure. What, what's unique about the Filipino experience compared to other Asian migrants where uh, they were not taught to speak Tagalog or other Philippine languages that other first generation migrants had brought with them? Mm, uh, I can answer uh, from uh, my students' point of view. Um, ano sila? Uh, kasi yung mga Pilipino nga, um, ang medium of instruction sa Pilipinas ay Ingles. Kaya yung mga unang mga immigrante sa Amerika, mga farm workers sila, mga magsasaka sa California at sa Washington. Uh, hindi sila bihasa mag-ingles masyado. Kaya nung nagkaanak sila later on, yung mga descendants, uh, yung, yung mga magulang, nagpa-practice sila ng ingles doon sa mga anak nila. Samantalang ang mga Chino at saka mga Japanese at saka mga Korean, um, buo yung komunidad nila. Uh, hindi talaga marunong mag-ingles ang kanila mga magulang. Kaya nakadepende sila doon sa mga anak nila. Yun ang kaibahan ng mga Pilipino dahil naging kolonya ang Pilipinas ng Amerika. Kaya marunong mag-ingles kahit papano yung mga, Amer uh, mga Pilipinong magulang. Yun ang nakikita kong kaibahan. Mrs. Nietas or Dr. Acampo, perhaps uh, you can let, share your uh, personal experience as well. Let me add something to this. I understand from many of the people I talk to what they call the bridge generation, the children of the original uh, group of people who came. They said that they were in school, they were taught to speak only in English because you cannot compete in America unless your English is good. So they learned to speak better English than the first generation or first wave of people and that's carried on until they reach college and they're asked what ethnicity are you and they say Filipino and they say do you speak the language only then do they realize that they really missed out on learning how to speak the language when they were still young so that my that in my own observation is what I have heard from other people yeah, and to, to add to that, think, again, I'm a sociologist, and so I'm always going to think about things from that perspective. If you think about which migrants come, they're, on average, more likely to have a higher level of English proficiency than Filipinos who don't migrate to the United States. And what that means is that the, the areas of employment, the neighborhoods in which they can live, they have the, the, you know, the likelihood that Filipinos are settling in places that are more ethnically and racially diverse 
and thus places where English would be the everyday language. It's higher for Filipinos than for Vietnamese, Chinese, um, and, and Korean, American, Korean immigrants. Uh, for those folks, having Korea towns, Little Saigons, Chinatowns is absolutely essential to their survival in ways that doesn't necessarily um, apply to the Filipino case. And so if you have Filipino Americans living in an environment where folks are really relying on English as the communication, English is going to be their go-to language and they just won't rack up enough hours speaking Tagalog to learn. Wow, those are really great points. And I, from as a follow-up to that, from that sociological perspective, if you think about, or um, could you speak to um, some of the migration patterns as well? Um, what what areas do did Filipinos um, typically select as um, they moved? Uh, what what were the the draws to Los Angeles to some of these primary locations, and how did that impact their um, either their need to adapt to, to to the language versus some of the other enclaves that um, have been able to retain the language um, as a result. Yeah, migration is a very network driven phenomenon, right? And so when when folks migrate here, there's there's a very classic pattern that emerges, you know, new immigrants will live in the homes of their more established relatives. Um, those established relatives are able to settle in communities that, um, you know, where they, they learn about opportunities and housing availabilities from other Filipinos. And so if you think about um, LA, for example, you have Eagle Rock, West Covina, Carson. And then of course there's certain like um, legal reasons for why Filipinos settled in some places like Carson, for example. That was one of the first places where Filipinos of an earlier generation in the 20th century were allowed to own property. It's, it, there's um, somewhat, it was, it was geographically close to where Filipinos were settling. Um, it was a racially diverse community where it was more of a, it, the environment was much more friendly toward Filipinos. And so you can imagine that that makes it easier for them to, you know, experience their upward mobility in, in a place like that versus like West LA, for example. Oh, you're muted again. Oh, okay, uh, tech guys. Hello. Thank you. Sorry, I think when I, when I mute myself, it automatically just uh, keeps it stuck. Um, thank you for that. And uh, to your point, I think there were also some covenants in real estate that kept us. I mean, this this was policy back in the day, and we don't realize that the policies that impacted black and brown the black and brown communities that. Um, uh, we sometimes don't consider ourselves to be a part of um, uh, those policies that affected where they would be able to buy property also impacted um, our communities. Um, here's a question from Isa Fabro. Uh, how do I address issues of racism with my parents? They're extremely conservative and berate experiences of other minorities with arguments that they don't work hard enough or they want a handout. Anyone want to tackle that? Uh, yeah. Um, we don't have the same starting line, right? So if you could imagine a lot of, um, Jennifer Lee, who's a sociologist at Columbia, uses this wonderful analogy of, of baseball, right? And so you got to imagine that given the English proficiency, the cultural familiarity, the the economic standing of the Filipinos that arrive here after 1965, which is the majority of Filipinos that come, they're starting on third base. And so their children have much more opportunity to make it to home plate, right? If you can imagine someone who doesn't have the same privilege, they don't have legal status, they are working in, as a dishwasher or in industries where there's absolutely no room for upward mobility or economic opportunity, um, that is likely to put them in particular neighborhoods that are more policed, higher crime. The school districts are terrible because school districts are based on property tax. And so you can imagine that the resources available to their children and grandchildren and future generations are just absolutely different and not the same um, than, than Filipino Americans who tend to live 
on average in more middle-class settings, have more resources to draw upon. And let me just be upfront. Um, there is this, this country was built on anti-blackness. Again, this country was built on anti-blackness. What that means is that immigrants, since the history of immigration in this country, have often measured their success based on how different and how distant they are from black people. And that's an unfortunate thing. And so it's, it's important to note that um, a lot of the experiences of, I'll just use black Americans, um, you know, you can be as respectable as possible. You can build um, entrepreneurial communities. You can become doctors and lawyers. But the fact of the matter is black people in this country, regardless of their educational background, regardless of their professional standing, are going to still be stopped by police, no matter how they act, no matter if they pull their pants up. And that's just something that as Filipinos, we don't experience to the same degree, not nearly the same degree. And that's something that we just have to accept is that this country is built on anti-blackness and that racist glass ceiling affects the everyday lives of black people and descendants of enslaved people to this day. Well, I guess Aisa Fabro says it's been an ongoing conversation with her and her parents, I guess, where, mm -hmm. where she's tried to share those historical facts like redlining and police for profit, but they call it fake news. I guess this is up for a bigger and longer, you know, bigger conversation and um, uh, which we can tackle further on in other, in other webinars. Now, um, there's also a comment from Ms. Perla Santos. It is to the disadvantage of our ethnic group that we don't claim there's a need for Filipino, trans for Filipino translated information or educational materials for services available, unlike other ethnic groups, because we understand English anyway. How do you think we can advocate for that in order that support, such as funds and grants, can also be provided to us for various programs? Uh, does anybody want to answer? And I think Ms. Anna Marie has some technical difficulties. And also Isaac Fabro commented that, you know, um, while conversing with her parents, she still tries to do it respectively, of course, because it is part of our culture and heritage that we, even though we have healthy conversations, with, uh, healthy and lively conversations with our parents, we of course still do it with respect. So yeah, does anybody want to answer with regards to um, uh, Ms. Perla's uh, question? Um, I'll tackle that. This is Anna Marie, and I'm sorry, my video is not working for some reason. Uh, but when I when I mentioned uh, funding or the access to capital for businesses and the policy that impacts which communities are prioritized or included in some of these um, uh, mechanisms, that's also true for foundation funds. Um, when community organizations are having to fight over smaller amounts of um, funding because the community is not unified enough. And I'm talking about the broader AAPI community. Um, we're either not um, uh, vocal about those needs. Part of that is the um, really the harm of the model minority myth, right? That makes us believe that we're a community that does not um, ever need um, any assistance that were a monolith. And I know that Dr. Acampo, Acampo can speak more to this as well. Uh, something that has emerged in the last few months is um, with all of the anti-API hate crimes, we have also recognized the need to unify and the need to um, build coalitions across different um, mul multicultural coalitions and multiracial coalitions uh, to speak about these um, these needs. And one of the big changes is the call on corporations to put their money where their mouth is, right? To really uh, invest in our communities. And uh, that's a that's a two-way street. We can't just wait on these corporations. We are we are consumers. Um, immigrants are, are a a P AAPI or Asian immigrants are one of the largest, um, uh, the fastest growing groups. Um, and currently we are 23 million strong, but we still need to uh, demand that these corporations and these um, other organizations include us at the table, that we are also part of those, those decisions and those, um, uh, those um, efforts. 
Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Anne Marie. And I guess if we do not have, okay, there is one last question for Ms. Ethel Rubio. Um, so I guess this is for Ms. Anne Marie Cruz. What kind of advocacies do you personally do within your work to grow the share of funding to Filipino American enterprise? Well, in terms of my work with ICIC, I definitely have been, um, I've actually partnered with some of the uh, consulates, including Hawaii, to um, increase representation of Filipino-owned businesses in these trainings and these um, capacity building um, education programs. Um, but when it comes to capital, part of it is um, education, part of it is supporting um, the the other organizations I partner with uh, to make them more visible to our, um, our community, whether it's entrepreneurship or other Filipino led um, organizations I am familiar with. Um, but I mentioned that very specific policy around CDFIs. That's not something that I can change directly, but I, th I think that if I can share more about it, hopefully the more, <laughs> the more people uh, you know, learn about that, the more they can also advocate for it um, and talk to their electeds. Um, I mean, this is also uh, part of our civic engagement um, work that, you know, we should be looking at what policies impact our communities and, and play a role in, um, in, in making those changes. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ms. Anna-Marie. Now we have one last question from Victoria B. How might we decolonize education with our parents and families? I have a number of family members that praise members that are in nursing school and not those that are in the arts. So who would like to comment on that? I'll tell you one thing. Um, you can lay all the facts in the world, all the history, all the data, all the evidence, and you're st there are still going to be folks who will be resistant to empirical data. Um, and in my experience, it takes a variety of different approaches. So sometimes facts work, but to be honest, I think part of the what psychologists show is that if you like storytelling goes a long way if you tell stories enough stories that that functions as evidence that directly contradicts the one-dimensional stereotypes that folks have over time those break down one of the reasons that um you, you know you have these examples of like people in biracial relationships where you know the parent is super racist and then all of a sudden they have a kid and then the kid all of it warms the, the dark racist heart of the grandparent, right? And I th think that part of the reason is because the, the idea of a kid being the object of one's animosity and hate, it doesn't sit with the way that most people feel about children, which is usually positive and warm. And so it just leads to this contradiction that is that needs to be unraveled. And it's when those stereotypes get unfrozen that we have the starting point to start to inject more diverse examples that can counteract those terrible, terrible stereotypes that we all know that people in our community have. Yeah, I guess everyone here in this webinar has some, some kind of experience with regards to your comment and of course that question. And I think we all relate to that. And oh, with that, I would like to thank everyone um, especially our moderator, Ms. Anna Marie Cruz, and our speakers, Dr. Acampo, Dr. Domingo, and Mrs. Little. Um, well, I guess this is all the time that we have for this e evening. Again, thank you very much to all our speakers for sharing their time and expertise. Thank you also to all our online participants. We appreciate all of you, and we hope uh, you will continue to engage and promote our community and programs under the Consul General's uh, leadership. Now, before we end this, may we ask everyone to uh, give a smile and pose for a group photo. So I guess our one of our tech guys will be doing that. Just smile. And I think we're good. I think you are. I guess you are. Okay. Now, of course, to keep you updated with our upcoming activities, please like us on Facebook. It is Philippine Consulate General in Los Angeles or visit our website at 
www.philippineconsulatela.org. Na maraming maraming salamat po at mabuhay po kayong lahat. Maligayang buwan ng pambansang pamana. Happy National Heritage Month. My name is Vice Consul Marcus Carado. Have a good evening and have a great, great, great rest of your week, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.